PT and welcome to Greatest TV Cock-Up Moments. Tonight, we're going to be reliving those moments when television goes horribly but hilariously wrong. Yes, that's right, I'll be bringing you the very best of the worst, technical hitches, embarrassing gas, accidental expletives and X-rated errors from the world of television. Tonight, each and every moment is TV gold and you not seem to think so because you've been voting for them in your thousands. Here's a quick sneak preview of your top 50 favourite greatest TV cock-ups. If you want a bit of publicity, then show a boob. Sherry Blair looked like hell. Oh, it was horrible. He knew it was horrible. <laughs> it was just so awful. I am a bit of a giggler anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise to all those people that I was so appalling with that day. Oh, my God! He stays in the memory as the athlete who was robbed of a gold medal. These things happen. It's live television. As you can see, there are plenty of cock-ups to come, so I'm going to make sure that I don't make any tonight. Kicking off our countdown, here's the moment you voted for at number 50, and it's starring 70s folk rocker John Otway on the old grey whistle test. Ooh, and he was totally sexy, and ooh, let me tell you, he was so cool. <laughs> The whistle test was a bit special, and I've never quite repeated the same sort of pain or agony live on television again. John Otway is great, fantastic manic performer. Just like uh, you, you put him on a stage, he, he breaks bones, he falls off the stage, he jumps off things, he's loads of crazy stuff. I've always done things like uh, leapt off step ladders and swung from ropes and things. Um, I used to probably hide what I hadn't got in musical talent with other things that would amuse audiences. You didn't know because he was kind of that wacky kind of performer. You didn't know how much of it was like deliberate and then how much of it wasn't and until the amp moment and then you thought, no, he's, he doesn't know what he's doing here. <laughs> One foot went one side of the amplifier, the other foot went the other side of the amplifier, and the whole weight of my body came piling down on the most delicate parts of my anatomy. And it hurt. <laughs> The thunder cracks against the night. It was one of those moments, wasn't it? Cool, not cool, not cool. At 49, a lesson on how not to interview a feisty, punky rock chick with a bit of an attitude. It's B.A. Robertson's one-on-one -on -one with Annabella Lewin. I thought Annabella Lewin was, was dead cool. <laughs> She was on uh, this programme with B.A. Robertson, who was, uh, who was hosting the show. He was obviously pissed off that he'd had to have her on the programme because he didn't respect her as a musician at all. So he just took the piss. Tonight is Ladies' Night. My first talkative guest is indeed a lady in every traditional sense of the word. All froth and flounce, acres of chiffon and lace. <laughs> Each and every sequence sewn on by herself. Tireless night spent at home over the sewing box. I guess it was written, you know, presumably in an ironic way, but the way he delivered it, he just wasn't really kind of getting the laughs, and it was obviously winding her up. She was furious, you know, just her looks said everything. She did her speech about, you know, we have enough rubbish to put up with if you're in the music industry. A lot of girls in the music business have a hard time, I reckon because a lot of uh, males find it easy to sort of take the mick out of them. And it was like, oh, so do you want to go? You know, a sneering, do you want to storm out then? Just, yeah, right, and she was off. Well, I don't know, I don't know what the audience reckon, but uh, I think it's a pretty shit show, basically. Right. What, well, do you want to go? Yeah, I wouldn't mind, actually. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I think Annabella was absolutely right to swear and walk off the show. That's what we want from our rock stars. You just you want to sit there and engage in some sensible debate. You want hand gestures and rude words and strops. Fantastic. Yeah. The next cock up at 48 features a faulty windbag. No, it's not Matthew Wright, but it did happen on his show. 
it was Burns night, uh, and we thought that, you know, cliche, cliche, let's get a bagpiper on. Enjoy Burns night wherever you are, George. Take it away. Don't let him give you any of this nonsense about, oh, there's something wrong with my pipes. One of the drones had actually dropped out and therefore was allowing air to escape, so I wasn't able to blow up the bag. I think it was his nerves that got him in the end. Oh! He obviously couldn't play the bagpipes. Not only that, he looked a stranger to the concept of bagpipes. He's like, he's, he's like what is this? This is just weird. Surely I can't get away with this. <laughs> It's at these bagpipes, these accursed bagpipes. I think quite amusing, actually, quite good television. George, on the other hand, was destroyed. I mean, absolutely destroyed. I suppose I was partially numb in the fact that uh, here was my first occasion on live television and uh, I didn't succeed. George, do you just want to hum it? <laughs> 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 well, Sorry about away. That. Never mind, sir. George, take it away. This moment has gone down in the annals of history as a classic, and it's courtesy of news reporter Colin Baker. Nearly every reporter I've, I've ever met absolutely adores that clip. They've all seen it. They've all felt like that. Colin's gone down in, yeah, media history for saying what he said. And even his fellow inmates at Wormwood Scrubs, those who he's speaking on behalf of, won't be told his identity. Colin Baker, for Thames News, Westminster. Soaked with cold feet and an aching heart, <laughs> married several children. <laughs> Really off. He said all the things he absolutely felt, and everybody who's ever been outside, either as a newspaper journalist waiting on a doorstep, or as a television journalist trying to do the news, will understand exactly how he felt. Soaked with cold feet and an aching heart, <laughs> married several children, pissed off, really dreadfully pissed off. The best bit was when he said married with several children. You know, he didn't even say how many. He was clearly close to a breakdown. I'm sure that after the filming goes on, he just starts just taking off his clothes. I've had enough! Come on! Just runs off down the Royal Marg and I'm finished! Fuck telly! You just don't expect the megastars to mess up, do you? But that's exactly what Dallas star Larry Hagman did at the 1980 Royal Variety performance. He was, at that time, the biggest star in the world. JR was the biggest. To get Larry Hagman on the Royal Variety performance 25 years ago was a big deal. I mean, Larry Hagman was JR in the TV show Dallas. Everyone knew who he was, and he did this song, sending that up. He did a song about being a bit of a git, about being really horrible, and about a few of my favorite sins, I think it's called. Needing that poker to win me some dollars, twisting the ear of a kid till he hollers. I was watching on the monitor on the side of the stage, and I went to myself, he's going to dry up, because it was a song specially written for him. And I went, he's going to go. And my goodness, he went. I rear him and shear him and skin him alive. Ah, la, 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 and I forgot that particular lyric. rum di 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 Everybody was cringing backstage. My recipe for the cake of good living. One a pound of given for one pound of given. Uh-oh, it'll all come back. Uh -huh. He makes a total, total, absolute pig's ass of it. Sift out the scruples and store in a jar. Hell, you know my name. <laughs> I was doing so well. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. He knew it was horrible. I think he apologised to the Queen. The royal family have always hated the royal variety show, you know, because um, it goes on for far, far too long. We are not amused. Next up at number 45, it's Harriet Harman's political gap. Don't ever say that politicians don't have a sense of humour after watching this. 
When Harriet Harman talked about Gordon Brown being Prime Minister, it was obviously a Freudian slip. She'd meant to say Gordon Brown the Chancellor. The brilliant thing about this gaffe was the timing, because this was just a day after Gordon Brown had delivered his budget in 2004, and there was a massive issue of whether or not Gordon Brown was desperately trying to take over Tony Blair's job as Prime Minister. Massive infighting between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. Everyone knew about it. It's in the papers every day. He's in yeah, okay. He has increased it by over right. 50,000 over the last three or okay. four years. Harriet Hamm. Since Gordon Brown became Prime Minister, uh, unimportant. <laughs> really was the Freudian slip of the decade. The other politicians really do wallow in her embarrassment. Gordon Brown, hmm, now who is he? I've been in government with this guy since 97. Is he Prime Minister, is he Chancellor? You should know by now, Harriet. I was gonna, you know, there's no do, doubt of that do, one. Do you want to start okay. again? Harriet Hart. Okay. <laughs> Can imagine it's going to be a little bit hot for her when she gets back to Downing Street and has to explain that one. It was like one of those do moments. Well, this must have been David Frost's worst nightmare. You know, he's got a serious political programme and then all these yippies turn up and start rolling spliffs on his stage and it's live TV. There's nothing he can do about it. You, do you smoke dope? No. Well, let's try it. We'll start. What sort of, what sort of dope are you in favour of? All dope? <laughs> We'll light it up first. They just sort of invaded the podium. I mean, he was having a, a, a discussion which was going, which was really going really rather embarrassingly, actually. Um, and then suddenly, and he said, well, all right, come out, and the whole lot came down. Oh, the new society, let's go. Come on, everybody, come Have on. Now, Robert, right. carry on. All right, all right, let's go. I think Frost handled it really, really well. Jerry, no, no Jerry, no, no, it's a reasonable question, and Jerry's a reasonable yeah, man, he'll probably answer it. Yeah. He's not reasonable, man, he's my son. In my life. <laughs> and then finally the C word was used, which of course sent David Frost completely ballistic. I'm laughing so. childishly when you oh, manage to say oh, a four-letter word oh, on television. Oh, big deal. Big OK, man, how many times have you said a four-letter word on television? Never, and I hope I never I will, well, because it's so deal, pathetic and so oh, childish God, and so <laughs> pointless, <laughs> and we'll be right back. I would think if any of them are still alive, they'd be fascinated to watch that now. I don't suppose many of them survived all the stuff they were taking at the time. At 43, the enfant terrible of British art, Tracy Emin, gives us a masterclass in the art of being drunk and disorderly. It was a talk about whether painting was still at the centre of art or whether conceptual art had taken over. Tracy's a, a, an artist who paints well, you know, when she has a go at it. But there aren't... And Tracy Emin was brought in as a sort of trendy conceptual artist, or the one conceptual artist that everyone had heard of. I'm drunk, had a good night out with my friends, I'm leaving now. Tracy is a lout. That's all there is to it. Give her drink and she turns into somebody who's a lout mouse and with, with no manners. She has very few manners to begin with. You people aren't relating to me now. You've lost me. Mm. You've lost me completely. One of the things that was truly weird, amongst a lot of little things, was her finger being in a splint. There was no rationalising of it. She never said, by the way, you know, I've broken my finger. No one will this fucking mic on me. On, now, I want to put it off. I'm mean, free. She was as drunk as a lord well, well, and did not have the manners of a lady. So I think there was acute embarrassment, but it was kind of enjoyable cringing is probably most people's experience of that programme when they were watching it. Even my mum, I'm going to phone her and she's going to be embarrassed about this conversation. It's live, but I don't care. I think you're a fuck about it. I'd be quite pleased to see her go altogether. Oh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I can't really understand why she occupies the intellectual position and the aesthetic position that she does in the cultural life of this country. Here's a truly shocking mistake that's definitely not for the faint-hearted. It's featuring TV presenter Anthea Turner and it's at 42. The show Up To You was a live Saturday morning children's television show that came from Manchester. It's in Carlisle with the Over To You team and Anthea, while well, she's got the roving eye down at the Royal Tournament in Earl's Court. Stand by your phones, here comes the show. And the big idea was that I would pick up from London and say, um, well, I'm supposed to be taking part in a motorbike uh, display, but I can't see any motorbikes. 
and there was a lorry which had black sugar paper and the motorbike at that point would be queued and would come flying out of the paper and that's where sadly it went a little bit wrong because the person who was queuing the motorbike mistook my cue to speak as the cue to ask the motorbike to fly out of the back of the van and of course I'm still sitting on the tailgate. And if you want something to happen to you on this... My understanding in the Anthea Turner incident was that there was a last minute change in, in what was to happen and uh, that the, the, there was obviously a safety implication because she was closer to the flash pots uh, and this wasn't adequately assessed. Um, a few minutes ago you might have just seen something a bit dangerous happen to Anthea. Just here to say she's okay, she's just gone to first aid and she's going to have a nice hot cup of tea because she's got some shock. When the motorbike came flying out, he brushes my arm pushes me towards the pyrotechnic, which sets fire to my hair, my sleeve, the back of my hand. And I sort of roll, if I remember rightly, I think I just roll onto the floor with a horrible smell of burning hair and bacon. I think it's a very useful uh, example of how things can go horribly wrong. Uh, and certainly we use it in, in health and safety training to, to, to emphasise that. I was actually very, very lucky that I got away with my life. She's going to have a nice hot cup of tea because she's got some shock. Way before GMTV and even the Big Breakfast, we had TV AM. During the late 80s, it was played by industrial action. Everybody out! Here's 41. The TVAM technician strike, well, it didn't really start as a strike, it was just a one-day walkout by technicians, and then Bruce Gingle, the boss, said, well, you can't come back. Bruce Gingle decided that he would uh, keep the station running, and so he got together all the various members of uh, executives and secretarial staff and anybody he could to operate the cameras and to work the whole thing. At the time, I was um, the PA secretary, actually, to the um, Labour Relations boss, so overnight, I became the camera operator. What viewers saw, however, was a catalogue of cock-ups. Off to a flying start with the first news of the day from Gordon Honeycomb. You can put your own microphone on, but is it actually going to come out on air? We don't know. Somebody's actually got to physically push the lever up and they're looking at all these levers and buttons and thinking, I don't know which one to press. Yes, um, hello, good morning. Sorry about the loss of sound there. Trish was telling you that we'll be back to the GoBots after the news. Sound was so hit and miss, and uh, a v you were lucky if a VT rolled. But right now, it's time to join a man who's guaranteed to set you up for a sunny start for the week. Of course, it's Richard Keyes. <laughs> a really high-tech weather board. Oh my goodness, we're on the, completely on the wrong board. I don't believe this. That is the six o'clock picture. Let's quickly start again at the beginning here. <laughs> These things happen. It's live television. Quite often it was uh, tricky um, knowing when you were going to be on air to do your next bit. So will you come in? Oh, are we here? Yes, we are. I don't, uh, people, if they wandered into the studio, were more than likely to end up on air. <coughs> Absolutely anything that could go wrong did go wrong. What was interesting though, of course, the viewing figures went up because it was just fantastic telly. We love cock-ups and TVAM gave the people what they wanted. Time for a cock-up that leaves actress Christine Larty feeling rather flushed. This is the moment you voted for at number 40. The Golden Globes are an awards ceremony in Hollywood. They happen January every year. Uh, and they're sort of a pre-runner to the Oscars. Here are the nominees for best performance by an actress in a television series drama. Christine Lotti, Chicago Hope. Christine Lotti, who surely must have been to award ceremonies before, and surely must have known when her award was coming up, you get a running order, had decided to go to the lab. And the winner is... Christine Lotti. at the moment, I believe. Uh, so. oh. <laughs> she probably didn't know that her award was about to happen, and that is every producer's nightmare. 
the thought that when you announce the winner, the winner is going to be in the toilet, because it could easily happen. Usually in award shows, people are like, oh, I didn't think I'd win. And then they've got like a 20 page, you know, speech with them. If you're in the loo, you really didn't think you're going to win. Oh, my God. Oh, I, I thank you so much. <laughs> I was just flushing the toilet and someone said, you won. And I thought they were joking. And I, I thought, what a terrible joke. Oh, my God. Personally, I would have preferred it if she'd had her skirt tucked into her pants. I think that would have been funnier. Maybe a bit of loo roll on her shoe, but it was a nice touch. Oh, my God! Pay attention, folks. Next time you go on a roller coaster, you might want to take a crash helmet. And make sure you keep a lookout for loo flying birds, too. Here's 39. That has to be the funniest, funniest thing I have ever seen. It is the most disastrous PR stunt ever. <laughs> Fabio was America's sort of first model slash actor slash cover of a Mills and Boone kind of guy. He was the romantic, long-haired, dishy hunk. Goes to open up this theme park in Bush Gardens. I'm flying without he comes back with a bloody nose. <laughs> <laughs> All you could think of was, how did that happen? It was a goose that hit him in mid-air. <laughs> just a bird, just right in the middle of his face. It's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Everyone's looking, oh, look at Fabio. He's going to be there now. You know, we see, we see Fabio's nose, right? I feel sorry for the bird, right, because... His nose has got to be bigger than the bird. <laughs> I'm in great press for the roller coaster. Not. It's surely the first time that Fabio has objected to having a bird in his face. It all goes horribly wrong live on Breakfast TV for news presenter Tanya Beckett. One really should expect better from the BBC at number 38. <gasps> oh, Lord! Wasn't that absolutely awful? G whose fault was that? Instead of doing a, you know, good morning, thank you for being with us, she just went straight in. Managing Director of Internet at NTL, Jerry Rust, joins me now. What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong in, yeah. uh, in your offer? I'm afraid this is not what I'm talking about. I'm not... I'm afraid we obviously have the, <laughs> the wrong guest here. That's uh, deeply embarrassing for us. When the camera's not on you, there are people being shoved in and shoved out and pushed from one direction or another. And uh, the presenter usually doesn't get a chance to talk to the person until they're on air asking the questions. You are not, uh, you're not Jerry, obviously, no, so I'm I've not. got the wrong person. I ask in the green room, you know, people. I should have memorised that. To interview someone and actually be thinking you're interviewing somebody completely different, that is a serious, serious cock-up. So, um, let's talk about something else. Perhaps what I did at the weekend, no. But it, I don't think people realise that you're literally, there's a conveyor belt going on next to the camera shoving people in and out, so I guess it's bound to happen. Next up, it's moment 37, where lovely Glory Hannaford can't stop corpsing live on air. That's Telespeak for laughing, by the way. I am a bit of a giggler anyway, and there have been moments when um, I, I've totally corpsed live on air. You just don't expect some institution like Gloria Honeyford to actually just corpse in the middle of an interview and break down in laughter, especially not basically about farting. Of course, you've had all of that styled. Now, at least we have our wind machine here to blow <laughs> yeah. your dress and come in through the door. <laughs> Do you carry your own wind machine with you? Oh, I try not to, know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gloria, no, I try not to. And, and in a way, the clip is funny be as much because of her as it is because of what I've said. After what, you know, had slipped out, then we just, uh, Gloria started to laugh. And I couldn't believe it. She kept laughing for a good two or three minutes. <laughs> Brilliant, well, that would be a different tale. <laughs> <laughs> the thought 
for farting up a dress, you know, that iconic scene, just tickled her beyond speech, and she, it just went on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of laughed, and then the real impact of what I'd said set in, and it just was one of those silly situations where it kind of, you titter on, and then you say something crass like, oh, that's really funny, and then you titter on more. I think that's really funny. <laughs> Wait, thank you, Gloria, so much. See you later, sweetie. <laughs> That was the week that was, was, was the programme to watch on a Saturday evening. It was live, it was satirical, it, you know, it really meant something to people because it, it, it was so instant. And one of the people on it uh, was Bernard Levin, who at the time was a theatre critic. Could you elaborate? One minute, Mr Levin, before you begin, it won't take a minute. Could you stand up? Mm -hmm. Mr Levin, your review of Cabotry and the Light was not a review, it was a vicious attack on it. Well uh, would you mind going back? just one tiny thing to be done. <laughs> I think it was this, this guy's wife had been um, in a play that Bernard had savaged, probably quite rightly, because I, I do think he was a brilliant critic. Uh, and this, and, and, but the weird thing was that he was so polite about it. Nowhere else in the world, if you were defending your wife's honour, would you so politely say, you know, excuse me, you know, would you mind standing up while I beat three barrels of shit out of you? That's one tiny thing to be done. <laughs> It wasn't like a pop of punch, it was just, it was very ungainly, you know, by the time debate is brought down to the level of violence, even if you're not very good at it, it just looks like a schoolboy skirmish. Just one tiny thing to be done. It's the forerunner of the Jerry Springer show, isn't it? Now we're used to people taking shots and pot shots of one another on TV. But this is the forerunner, but done with exquisite middle-class British taste. Can we concentrate on non-violence, you and I? <laughs> In 1963, somebody getting assaulted live on the air was just unthinkable. It's completely outrageous. I mean, it's outrageous now, but we're more likely to expect it now. Back then, it's unthinkable. I did it because I got, got up on a Sunday morning and I was watching um, MTV and I saw Robbie Williams doing the rock D DJ video where he strips. So I just thought it'd be a good idea because I was going to the football match if uh, someone did a streak. It was a streaker, by the way, in the second half. It wasn't Stan, uh, no matter what you might have made of that. Here's our culprit. <laughs> This particular streak really takes the biscuit because I've seen it in slow motion, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> the slow motion shots are just vile. <laughs> I have to say, my stomach was turning watching it. Naked bodies should never be seen in motion and never, ever be seen with boots. Everyone says typical male always leaves his socks on, but and my shoes on as well. <laughs> Bertie the Bee was absolutely magnificent. His tackle will go down in the annals of soccer history. Well, it's amazing, if you watch, the score of the game is written on the rear side of the streaker. The question to be asked is, who put that there? Now, that really was a cock-up, wasn't it? At 34, here's newsreader Sam Mason, who just can't stop sniggering. And the owners say the way they want it to stay is that as, as it is. On to soccer. That was a bit wrong, wasn't it? And there were mixed fortunes for the Bristol clubs in the FA Cup third round replay. I think people absolutely love to see newsreaders get it wrong, and I think they love to see newsreaders being human. <laughs> newsreaders are supposed to be terribly, terribly, terribly serious. And it's the fact that we expect them to be so serious, they know we expect them to be so serious, that when they get the giggles, I think it's actually quite funny. <laughs> the trouble news. I felt quite sorry for her, actually, because she had to go through a few more stories. She got to do the weather, she got to do the traffic, and uh, the poor woman just could not stop laughing. And everything's fine on the railway this morning. Next up, a slip of the tongue on a live phone-in on The Chris Moyle Show. You could say it was so going to happen. Well, swearing on the Chris Moyle show was an accident waiting to happen. I mean, you can't expect someone to control themselves when you set a TV show in a pub and it's kind of really laddy sort of atmosphere. And Chris Moyle's, you know, he's a bit of a wag, so anything goes with it. Here's Jazz in Birmingham. Hello, Jazz. How you doing, mate? All right. You got your own company selling chrome wheels to rich people. Did you feel the quake last night? I fucking did. Oh, no, no! <laughs> 
think the guy meant to swear. I think that's just the way he talks. He obviously just uses that word generally. And uh, he forgot, yeah, it's offensive. <laughs> I fucking did. Oh, no, no! For that. Swearing on live TV is a uh, every presenter's nightmare because you're always held responsible. You can't say <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Jazz, apologise, please. I will. <laughs> it's extraordinary how many people will call in and complain if someone says it just inadvertently, just in casual chat. <laughs> that never happened in rehearsal either, did it? You let the public in. It's like lancing a boil. Anything could happen. Just in your face. It's going to come back and hit you. This moment has gone down in the annals of history as a classic at 32. I've always found it a bit disappointing because Grace Jones looks like a man but hits like a girl. He was very bad because he really basically turned his back on her. She notices the deterioration. Are you wearing perfume? Mm. Can you smell her at no, all? No, I've got my own body odour perfume. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and keep it on a slightly higher level if we may. <laughs> I think she felt she was being ignored. I think she wanted the full attention because she said, don't turn your back on me. And he, she didn't like the fact that there was another guest there. She just wanted to be me, me, me. She sensed that Russell wasn't talking to her or wasn't giving her the attention that she thought she deserved. Are, we, are you wearing perfume at this No, point? no, I'm I've, I've very seldom right. do no, wear no, no, If you turn your back no, no, on me one more minute, I, have, I, have I got, mean, really. I have got Grace, to quite to rightly, to felt as though she wasn't being loved enough by Russell. After all, she was a guest on his show, that he should have paid more attention to her. Maybe I should go right now, No, don't go right now unless you really want to. Well, don't turn your back on me anymore. I can't look at you. Now, hold, hold. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Just a moment. Just a moment. Me, 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 me. That's not an attack. I want to see her go to town. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit like a praying mantis, wasn't it? It's a bit like, like that, wasn't it? She should just whack him, really, pro like, properly, shouldn't she, you know? Here at number 31, it's the late, great Sir Robin Day with a horrendous moment from the early 80s. I'm not talking about the bow tie, by the way. Oh, this is a legendary political moment. Not many politicians actually storm out of live television interviews. Robin Day was interviewing um, John Knott, um, very Tory uh, and very proper, and you know, rather full of himself like that. Um, and it was on Nationwide, which again was a, a live program, and I actually was watching it. So Henry Leach said, and I apologise for quoting him again, but he's been 45 years in the Navy and I suppose he knows something about it. Robin Day had a reputation for being a bit pugnacious. I mean, he was the first of the slightly rude interviewers. He would go straight for the jugular, but that's what made him so successful at the time. And as I say, you wouldn't expect the first sea lord to say anything else. But why should the public on this issue, as regards the future of the Royal Navy, believe you, a transient, uh, here today and, if I may say so, gone tomorrow politician, rather very... than a senior officer of many years? I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm fed up with this interview, really. It's a ridiculous ruling. When he said to John Knott, here today and gone tomorrow, uh, which is actually, after all, true of all politicians, I mean, they all go someday, John Knott got very upset about it. I'm not staying and just sort of, and sort of stormed out in a, in a very huffy way. And it was hilarious. I couldn't have liked it more. I'm, I'm fed up with this interview, really. It's a ridiculous rolling room. Well, thank you, Mr. Knott. Ooh! What do you mean this next one's all about Eve? Who's Eve? Oh, sorry, all about Eve, the 80s rock band. Yep, next up at number 30. Live Top of the Pops, adrenaline pumping, you know, as soon as it starts, it's, you know, little big build up, Top of the Pops, hello, here we are, welcome, off we go. And no room for error. Julianne Reagan has got a beautiful voice, and she is part of All About Eve, they're at 22, aren't they? Martha's Harbour! Yeah! The presenters have said she has got the most amazing voice, and then it cuts to the singer and her guitarist, and she's just sitting there going, Sea calls to me, I hide in the water, but I need to breathe. P. 
people, you know, obviously um, realised many of the bands were miming because they were crap at it. Uh, but in this instance, they knew <laughs> this was not um, the real thing. But I felt so sorry for her. She just sat there with all this dry ice kind of billowing around her in this kind of gothic -y sort of mysterious way. We suddenly hear the crowd giving it loads, clapping, and it kicks in, and she picks up half the way through. I think she probably felt quite embarrassed about the whole thing, so I didn't get a chance um, to talk to her, and I know that she's never really spoken about it uh, since. Now it's S Club on Liquid News. Who'd have thought that a simple question from Claudia Winkleman about the band's manager, Simon Fuller, would have caused such drama? onto the studio floor. I've never seen anything like that. What you've got to love about um, S Club 7, um, when they were interviewed by uh, Dame Claudia on Liquid News, is they were clearly caught in the headlights. You see just how powerful the PR are in having a say in what questions are asked to their product, to their band here. And there would have been a verbal agreement at some stage when they were setting up a guest where they said, don't worry, we will not mention how much Simon Fuller is worth and we will not mention this big rumour that's in the paper. When S Club were on Liquid News, they just announced they'd split up. It had been in the papers that there'd been all this wrangling about money and they were moaning because they hadn't been paid anything by Simon Fuller. So it's obvious that the presenter, Claudia, is going to have to ask them a question about it. They must have known when they went on there. There are rumours, I don't know how true they are, that you guys are grumpy because you haven't made a mint. No, Had, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> are you not grumpy about it we at all? We didn't get I mean, a no mint. Grumpy. I would love a mint in my breath. I didn't yeah, I'm a bit punny, actually. But, um, no, just did you get I a think we're all punny. really, really lucky to be where we are today at our age and have the bank balances that we do have. I'm not having that. I'm not having you asking that question. I tried to stop this and I've had to walk in here. Can you got with Owen? I'm sorry. Can you stop it? No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This kind of half-hearted apology, even though she's coming and stopped live television. She made herself look like an idiot. The person who pulled them off, who perhaps looked a complete you know, geek for what they did, did the right thing. The chaos that would have been caused if they had actually answered that question. So just five minutes. Okay, well, I'm sorry, I wasn't sorry. Right. No, that's cool. How do you, how do you, what, what do you... That's as rock and roll as it gets for us, Club 7. They're walking off a set because they've been asked a real question. At number 28, here's two-time Oscar winner and Hollywood legend Meryl Streep accepting an award at BAFTA. What could possibly go wrong? What you see now with the BAFTAs and why they're more important than ever is that the big Hollywood stars actually come over to Britain to attend the BAFTAs. Uh, Meryl Streep's BAFTA faux pas I thought was pretty special because uh, what a place to make such a cock up. And the BAFTA for adapted screenplay is awarded to adaptation. Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman. Obviously, for us, it was fantastic that, Meryl that, that Charlie Kaufman won because it was Meryl Streep was going to pick it up on his behalf. She's like the American version of Dame Judi Dench. Everybody loves her, everyone respects her. She is a grand dame of, of acting. For somebody like her, though, to slip up, you know, she reads thousands of scripts, you know, she's on set for hours and hours a day. You know, it's her job to get everything perfect. I would like to spank th <laughs> really mortified and then it flashes to the audience. It's not like, you know, um, a load of has-beens in the audience. This is A-list celebrities feeling her pain with her. No one can believe that Meryl Streep slipped up. <laughs> Thank Spike Jones. <laughs> Famous for the way she speaks and the way she delivers lines. So to see her cock that up, I mean, that was the joke. I don't know, was that kind of slightly theatrical? I would like to spank, oh, oh, playing to laughs, to camera two. It was just a little bit rehearsed, but of course, because Meryl's such a consumer actress, are we ever going to know? Afterwards, when we spoke to her, she did say that she hadn't read it. And when she read it on stage, that was the first time she'd read it. 
Next up, it's GMTV's Eamon and Fiona. You can't blame them for being late at that time in the morning. I mean, I don't usually get up until lunchtime. You're watching GMTV with Eamon Holmes and Fiona Phillips. It is very unusual that, you know, you sort of, the director will call and uh, action, there you go, straight to the sofa. And there's no one there at all. I mean, that doesn't happen. <laughs> to be fair to them, um, the previous programme, the news hour, had finished early. Hang on a second, what, so what do you mean the news hour finished early? Where were you? You know what I mean? It's what, how early? Half an hour? No, like 30 seconds. You should have been there. <laughs> People just don't understand, do they? Oh, oh, dear. What on earth happened this morning? <laughs> I haven't they got finished anything. that news hour early. That's what happens. I told See? you. And they dump us in it. Yeah. We're supposed to be here. See, in most programmes, they would do the weather until the presenters came on, but yeah, not here. Not no, they here. love showing us up, but we're... Oh, Every morning, them two, they just moan about the fact that they're on there too early, and they moan about the fact that everybody else is doing everything wrong. And that's exactly what they did. They sat down and said, it's too early. They said, oh, everybody else got it wrong. The news should have been on, blah, blah, blah. And they just moan all the time it's brilliant it's fantastic stuff and you know you know that after the first commercial break the first thing there would be some very colorful language on the studio set you get your, you get <laughs> your bits together my entrails are still hanging out here <laughs> i hope not oh. time for number 26 back in the 80s clean cut and wholesome annika rice was queen of the small screen and she never made a mistake or did she Challenge Annika was a sort of new thing at the time. And that was, you know, where Annika was meant to be given a challenge for 24 hours, like, you know, build a hospital or, you know, organise an orphanage. And suddenly, you know, there she was. In this particular instance, uh, we were filming in a church. And I don't know what it is about sort of churches and vicars. We all were like we were back at school and um, the whole crew was in a, a state of great excitement and hysteria for some reason. We need six millimetre PLY. I don't know, what's PLY? Ply. Plywood. <laughs> That's um, eight feet by four feet sheets. Okay. Does that sound right? I'm, yep. I'm, I've been given a list, so I, I'm not exactly au fait with uh, some of these technical terms. Nails. <laughs> 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 and I just... Go completely. <laughs> it really goes on for hours, it seemed like. I was crying, I, you know, the, the crew were, you know, the camera just put down the camera and was rolling around down the aisle again. <laughs> and I, I try again, I go, OK, I'm fine now, of course I wasn't. We need 20 large buckets and sponges. <laughs> I had this terrible sort of battle to try and uh, get myself together, which I'm afraid I never did, and I apologise to all those people that I was so appalling with that day. Well, Blue Peter is live, and um, things always go wrong. Always. It's those very noisy white helmets. You saw them at the start of the show. I'm here with uh, Alistair. Alistair, why aren't you wearing the typical blue uniform like the others? tricky interviewing someone over that noise. You're kind of shouting, can't hear yourself think, and then just we're about to go for it. Silence. This evening that's being read by a Corporal Ed Lewis, and he's going to uh, take it away. Oh, but yeah. the engine's just cut out on the motorbike. I'm sure they'll get going any minute now. This is quite a tricky trick to do. OK, fine, that can happen. We'll just carry on, and I'm sure the bike will start, and they'll do the display. <laughs> Oh. It went on. I kept thinking to myself, they're going to cut on to something else. Um, they're going to tell me in my ear that we're going to do something. And nothing. It, they just left me. But in the meantime... It oh. There it is! There it is! Oh. oh, no! It's there. It's not. Miss Barker gave them terribly enthusiastic again. And then, it's not. They're going to do it this time. But they haven't. They fired each other. And it was like there was... I was an emotional wreck after that. It was their one moment, you know, they didn't get a chance to do it again. Nobody ever saw it. Um, but it was good. If you'd seen it, it was good. <laughs>
Well, I think that might be it for today. Oh. Uh, yes, it is. We haven't got much time to give him another kick, but not to worry. That's it. You never get a second chance, but I hope they got the Blue Peter badges. <laughs> yeah, everyone who comes on the programme gets a Blue Peter badge. If you've contributed to the programme, you get your Blue Peter badge, so of course they got it. Yeah. We couldn't do that to them. That'd be a bit cruel. <laughs> What can be more embarrassing than falling over? Falling over in front of a queen, that's what Terry Wogan did here at 24. You can't underestimate the enormity of Wogan's cock-up. This was, you know, it was his first live show. The BBC were really pulling out all the stops, you know. This was the big new chat show, three times a week. This particular artiste says he'll never talk to me again as long as he lives. I don't care. As long as he sings and plays. Anyway, it's only Elton John. <laughs> I'm a real fan of Wogan, I love Wogan. And when he falls over, he does a great kind of double take. He just, he falls over very quickly and then he's up again. He's like, oh, oh, I fell. Oh, but no need to worry. No, we're on again. We're on, on with the show. I just happened to fall there, but you hardly notice that it's so quick and I'm looking so suave. <laughs> Yes. Uh, it was just one thing during that. Jane Torval and Christopher Dean live. <laughs> Elton John is like that. I mean, he's one of the funniest people I know. He has a very, very sharp wit. And, of course, it's just, it was a gift of the gods for him. So, you know, Wogan has to take everything that Elton John gives him. And I'm promoting it, and the best way of promoting it was, of course, to appear on your ice show. <laughs> In actual fact, it made Terry, I think, look very charming. It made Elton John uh, very at ease, so you got a great sort of repartee going between the two of them. I could stand here for ages just talking to you all of You could Elton. fall down here for ages as well. <laughs> well, I can't be bothered. Yeah. <laughs> I think Elton John and Terry Wogan missed a chance there as well, because they were a great comedy double act. You know, forget the two Ronnies, this could have been the two Wiggies. <laughs> Next up, another chance to see a sporting blunder that didn't just shock marathon front-runner Vanderlei de Lima. It shocked the whole world, too. I think the saddest thing about the 2004 Olympics was what happened in the men's marathon. Although we like to laugh at comedy, that wasn't comedy. That was a little bit of human tragedy there, and I felt so, so sorry for him. It's the American Kaplazigi. Now, let's see. No, look, de Lima seems to be looking a bit worried. Uh, he just went to the side of the road. Wait a minute, uh, there seems to be a bit of a problem. Is he injured? Was he distracted? Did he fall? What on earth seems to have happened? It was one of those oh my god moments because nobody actually saw it, I don't think, the first time until they did the, the repeat because like, suddenly he was on the road and then he was off the road. And you think, has he staggered to the side? Is he having a drink? Is he having a wee? What's happened? Well, what's going on there? Something is up. He's, he's no idea what's going on. Uh, he definitely looks distressed now. Oh, there was a protester. There was a protester. I don't believe it. It wasn't a protester. It wasn't anybody making any sort of political statement. It was just somebody that had a screw loose and just pushed him off the side of the road. It's one of those things that would torture you, isn't it? It's like, I was winning until I was taken out by a madman. Oh, no, no, no. That, that, that's, uh, that is such a shame. The race was so well organised, and that's an absolute disgrace. And to have had such... Uh, lack of security that a runner could actually be pushed off by a member of the crowd. Absolutely appalling. As for having extra security, there's just no way you could have it. You know, every copper in Greece would have been lined up on those 26 miles and everywhere else in Greece there'd have been theft. Oh no, the marathon has been ruined with a protester rushing in from the side of the road. Uh, this athlete now will have everyone behind him after such a terrible tragedy. He stays in the memory as the athlete who was robbed of a gold medal. Back in 2004, Janet Jackson was left feeling rather overexposed after a titillating performance on the Super Bowl. If you want a bit of publicity, then show a boob. Just for a couple of seconds, bang, nipple comes out. But of course, it's in America, so they're all completely mental. And there's a big, ooh, God, you know, this can't happen and everything else. I can't wait to
dress was hideous. Anyway, so we're not surprised that Justin wanted to just rip it off of her. It was probably annoying him seeing her standing there in this creature from the Black Lagoon outfit. The Americans described it as a wardrobe malfunction. It was obviously choreographed. You could see him, you know, thinking, where's the Velcro to do this? Unfortunately, the whole thing went wrong in the end. I am really sorry if I offended anyone. That was truly not my intention. That kind of doesn't work, though, does it? Because if you're going to be all rock and roll, you can't then go and apologize for it. I think you have to stand by your kind of appalling, choreographed PR stunt. I think what rocked every record company in America now is, is the reaction of middle America against this stunt. The chaos it was called. I mean, switchboards were jammed with people complaining. And now everybody's paranoid of upsetting that big, big majority of sort of, you know, Christian-loving American public. So the following year, what the Super Bowl producers decided to do, get somebody else who's going to be as safe and as boring as white bread. So who do they get to perform? Paul McCartney. No chance of a scandal there. Now here's a rare moment at number 21. It's the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, looking dazed and confused for perhaps the first and only time on live TV. This shows Margaret Thatcher, then Prime Minister of our country, unable to actually grasp the concept of a phone-in. You know, the clue is in the title. She's on a show that's called Election Call. Uh, and it's your election call this morning to the leader of the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Margaret Thatcher. There's a huge picture of a telephone. Don't forget, if we do pick your call to question the Prime Minister, we'll call you back. The host is actually saying, yes, please phone in. You know, we've got so-and-so on the line. The first question comes from John Crawford in Carlisle. Mr Crawford, it's your election call to Mrs Thatcher. Good morning. And you've got Margaret Thatcher going, I can hear him, but I can't see him. Mr Crawford? Can you see yes. Mr Crawford? I'm sorry, can't. I thought you had. No, no, I can't see him. Where am I supposed I can only well, hear you, him. Well, that's right. He's on the telephone. Uh, go ahead, Mr Crawford, with your supplementary. Phone in. It's a phone in. He's not there. He's on the telephone, you stupid woman. No, no, I can't see him. Where am I supposed I can only but hear you, him. Well, that's right. He's on the telephone. She was just sort of totally perplexed, wasn't she? She didn't have a clue what was going on. You could see for just a minute that her eyes just switch a little bit like, OK, there's no screen, and I've made a big mistake. Tonight on PM Magazine, we're going to meet the man that formed this organization. We'll f <laughs> oh, shit. Oh! Monkeys, in general, can be very gentle, but uh, monkey society is based totally on dominance, and uh, so therefore you do get aggression amongst them. And they can be quite aggressive to people. It's just so funny, you know, there's that old rule at the end of the day, never work with children and animals, and that just proves why. We have found a haven for monkeys, monkeys of all shapes and sizes. Working with animals is always unpredictable. Guaranteed they're going to bite you or grab you or do something horrible. Even when they look really cute, they're often not. So you take a caged monkey on telly, it literally is rubbing salt into the evolutionary wound. It's like, you're brilliant, fine, fine, you're human and I'm a monkey in a cage on telly for your entertainment. <laughs> Well, most of the monkeys that you'll find here are unadoptable. They're the battered victims of human neglect and cruelty. Well, tonight on PM Magazine, we're going to meet the man that formed this organization. We'll... <laughs> oh, shit. Oh! <laughs> well, that's a good blooper! <laughs> she was this kind of sweet, innocent girl next door, and the first thing she did was shout, shit. It was great. <laughs> I forgot! <laughs> Monkeys. Well, if, if, the, if the presenter says that she hated monkeys, then she's going to be giving that out all too clearly, and the monkey would know it. And if the monkey knows it, then the monkey will have a go. It, she's, she's doing all the classic things wrong. I hate monkeys! A shocking revelation now at 19, when we found out that there was one old tradition that the Queen was apparently totally oblivious to. The situation at the Millennium Dome uh, was quite extraordinary for the Queen. At the centrepiece of the celebrations, the Millennium Dome, the Prime Minister hugged his wife while the Queen kissed the Duke of Edinburgh. Then the audience broke into a chorus of Old Lang Syne. It was one of those moments when the Queen quite clearly simply got it wrong. She didn't know what she was doing or what she was meant to do, and it was all very embarrassing. Cherie Blair in full voice before the royal party had even linked arms. 
that's not how you do it, love. It's that. Simple as that. Didn't know at all. Hadn't got a clue. She does have the look. Her eyes roll from side to side, and Tony Blair offers her her hand. She looks as though she perhaps absolutely hasn't done this before. <laughs> I'm not saying she doesn't know what to do with Lang Syne, but I don't really think that, from an etiquette point of view, the Queen would really be standing crossing her arms with the general public. I mean, don't forget, when she shakes hands with people, 90% of the time she wears her gloves. <laughs> Someone just needed to say, oh, ma'am, look, this is how you do it. And she would have done it, I'm quite sure, but nobody did. So we had this absurd picture of her out of tune with everyone else, flapping her arms around when she should have had them crossed. At 18, never has a song title been so fitting. Here's 80s singer Owen Paul's appearance on live daytime show Pebble Mill at one. Owen Paul was obviously a huge star at the time um, and all the bands were supposed to play live on Pebble Mill but they didn't always. And some super dresses there. But let's have some more music now and will you welcome please a young man who's about to have a big success in the charts with his latest single, Owen Paul and my favourite waste of time. The presenter was going to introduce me and oh, here we go, which is exactly what happened. And then nothing happened in the sound monitors at all. I never had one peep, one whistle, not a nothing. I decided that I wasn't going to move at all. I was going to stand like an oil painting until they got it back on or they cut away or something. He, he just kind of stood there and it was hugely embarrassing for everybody. It was absolutely excruciating. It's fantastic, and particularly because it's, you know, a favourite waste of time, which would be essentially turning up that day. You look pretty foolish too, saying, sorry about that. There we are. These things happen. Oh, sorry about that. You want to go, did you see that? Did you see? We were just outside the chart uh, the week before that television appearance, and I thought by losing the slot, the record would, you know, stall, maybe go back further down, and I'd lose airplay, and the song wouldn't happen. But in fact, the opposite happened. The record went through the roof. Manchester band The Stone Roses are totally mad for it due to a technical cock-up live on The Late Show at number 17. Stone Roses, they, they were the band that broke the whole Manchester scene. It ended up being the most, for me, I would say the most influential British band in the 90s. But when they were on The Late Show, this is the band just on, the, just on their breakthrough. They're just about to break through into the big time. I think there was a feeling that something was going to happen. Tonight, they play live on television for the first time, the Stone Roses. At that time, there was this obsolete system called an Ames Minim um, in the studio, which attempted to protect the hearing of uh, the, the crews that worked in the studios. Uh, so if a band played too loud for too long, it would trip out the power to their equipment. It went all right for about a minute, uh, 30 seconds or so, and then they hit the first kind of noisy passage. It could have been an utter disaster. It would have been a disaster for any other band. But they somehow they turn it round to, the, to their favour. I'm sorry about that. Looks like um, we've had a power shortage or something. So we'll move on to the next item. Ian Brown, in the background, then starts to heckle. We wasted our time, lads. And Ian, Ian Brown does like, you know, we're working with amateurs here, lads. We'll do it. We'll sort it out in a minute and the band kind of like slope off and it, it makes them look cooler. Amateurs! It's great to see a band that really does not seem to care about its, its big TV uh, moments going, like being, uh, being a total cock -off. I did happen to see John Squire, who's the guitarist of the Stone Roses and probably the person who made the loudest noise, uh, on Later with Jules Holland a few years ago and they showed him that clip and they said what happened and he said, 
Uh, well, as far as I can remember, we did the sound check and we thought it sounded a bit quiet, so we turned the amps up in between. A great seminal TV moment. The first President Bush was quite a popular Republican president. I am that man. So to see him bowling and then falling over was not the kind of thing you expect from a Republican. When you are electioneering, you're looking for the photo opportunity. Gone are the days when you can kiss babies and stroke dogs and turn up at hospitals. Um, they're cliche and they're seen through. You've got to create your own picture opportunity. It's quite a kind of a working class sport, you know, bowling. You could see that he fell over because he'd probably never done it before. There was something wrong with the approach that he was, he was on. It was very sticky at, at where he was for some reason. Um, and his foot just failed to slide forwards at the crucial moment, and he just lost balance because of that. Oh, I know, one of the people. Let's get you down the bowling alley, George. Just a dream. American. Uh, uh, bad idea. Nobody who goes to a bowling alley is ever going to vote for him after that. Next, here's cock up number 15. Now, it's not very often you get a bit of light entertainment during a news bulletin, is it? Hello, good morning. Now, your local news from us here at Channel Television. Sitting here slightly in the dark, I'm afraid, so bear with me. And I must admit, when the bulletin was over, well, uh, I just felt terribly relieved. Maybe they hadn't paid the bill, I'm not sure. But um, what was going on in the Channel News Bulletin, it looked like he was reporting from a rave. Members of La Societe Gendiez are outraged at plans to remove medieval beans from the town church. The lighting control panel crashed and uh, consequently they started firing randomly and going from pinks to blues to greens and all over the place. Parish authorities say they have no other option but to remove the historic timbers, but La Societe are urging islanders to do everything possible to overturn their decision. Well, he was very professional, but frankly, I thought that light show did quite a lot for the bulletin because it was so dull and worthy and plodding that at least the disco lights added a bit of effect. I thought if they did that every night, they might bring in a few more viewers. And the deputy fears the states could be sued if they make it difficult for developers to go ahead with refurbishing the market buildings. I didn't find it amusing at the time at all. I mean, in, in retrospect, it is, of course. Uh, but at the time, it's not amusing. Um, all I was trying to do is, is make light of the situation, I suppose. <laughs> Excuse the pun, but make light of the situation, yes. At number 14, antique expert Lauren Harris has a smashing time live on The Big Breakfast when, as usual, everything goes to pot. So I was on The Big Breakfast, and um, I was valuing antiques in Cardiff. Uh, everybody was bringing their antiques for me to value while they thought they were antiques. Good morning, madam. What's your name? Perry. Okay, no, I'm not sure if you can help her. Um, what have you brought? Perry, if you can come close, because I've only, <laughs> <laughs> I only got the one mic. <laughs> that, that was broken. How much is that worth? Well, now, I don't know. That sort of fantastic, invaluable antique pot or whatever it was. I mean, what a nightmare. How embarrassing to see these people watch their own personal crown jewels crumble in front of the lens. I mean, it's just horrible. Perry, if you can come close, because I only... <laughs> I only got the one mic. <laughs> that, that was broken. The presenters did react, and, uh, you know, they, they were obviously completely wrapped with what was going on. How much would it have been worth if it hadn't have been broken? Well, you could probably get about hundred pounds for it because Dan is definitely... right. Well, there you go, a hundred quid. A hundred quid. Is that how much it would definitely be worth? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it would be. Okay. Yeah. We're going to try and get. We're going to try and repair it and get and get it fixed. It was only worth about a hundred pounds then, and uh, and you know when it broke, of course, it, it wasn't worth anything. Ever had that sinking feeling? The crew of the 1978 University boat race did. Here's moment 13. They were just a whole boatload of beautiful, gorgeous fit men sinking. I think that's a waste. Conditions are the worst possible. Oxford are nearest the camera on the Surrey side of the river. Break is ahead, and there's trouble waiting for sure. Cambridge are unprepared. 
they catch crabs and their rhythm is dissolving in a cloud of spray. It was such a windy day and it was so rough that with every row they did, they're bringing more water into the boat and then there has to come a point when you've got too much water in the boat for them to be able to bail out. And so just slowly but surely, they disappeared beneath the waves. And the, the thing was, they still kept rowing, obviously, which is completely... It's, it's just a classic moment. I can remember watching that, thinking, oh, the sinking, oh, how hilarious, the toffs are going down, ha, 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 ha. And then there was just that split moment of like, oh, my God, I might die. Suddenly, the scene changes from a titanic rowing tussle to a rescue operation. I felt really guilty, because you just think, oh, let them sink, you know, do them good, you know, they are all, all got too much money. Poor bewildered Cambridge. Sad, sick, sorry and sudden, Cambridge are rescued in the nick of time. It was funny, then it was scary, then it was funny again. That boat race will go down in history as the most watched of all time. Next up, it's Sherry Blair, who's not feeling so fresh the morning after the night before the general election. Talk about a bad hair day. It's number 12. Sherry Blair looked like hell. It was the day after they'd won the election. <laughs> Bell rings, it's early in the morning, the day after the night before. Things can only get better. They're just dancing all night. Even if you've been up all night, you've got to make sure that you're looking, you know, presentable and also looking like the Prime Minister's wife, not just anybody who looks as if they're just about to clean a house. Cherie Blair had a rude awakening to life as the First Lady this morning. Like any other housewife, after the night or nights before, she wasn't ready for either well-wishers or photographers. Representing your husband and the country, you've got to make a bit of an effort. She would literally just sort of tumbled out of bed. I mean, she wasn't wearing any makeup or anything. She really looked like, you know, when you wake up in the morning, your face is sort of still, like, mattress-shaped. The hairstyle was, was bizarre. I mean, it was either a fright wig or a very patient cat that was sat on her head. And those flowers, I mean, what are they all about? She shouldn't have answered the doors to those flowers. They weren't good, were they? It was such a bad look. Sherry Blair wasn't feeling too glamorous this morning and forgot the world's now watching every move she makes. Those pictures and the footage is going to go all the way around the world. This is what the best Britain's got to offer. I'm just grateful, actually, she wasn't in a negligee or anything more revealing. Now here's a moment that's got a bit of bite to it. It's starring Richard Whiteley and a ferret. I know people have been bitten on by animals and other blooper programmes, but this seems to be the classic one. Dogs snap them up and catch them. And you lived like this for 18 months? Yes, 18 Where, Whereabouts months. was this? Was this in Yorkshire? Litchfield. Yeah. Ow, ow, ow! And suddenly I was aware, I was aware of this great, this, in, this huge unbearable pricking in the flesh of the finger. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Ow! It's all right, let it go. Put it on the floor, it won't hurt you. It is hurting me. And these, like, needles going in. And, uh, well, it was a live programme, and you're meant to keep composure, but I don't know, I just, I just lost it. Put it down. <laughs> what I particularly liked about the ferret was that it hung on for grim death. He didn't kind of, like, do what everyone was doing, like, whack it on the desk. And get on. He just sort of holds it as it's swinging. If you just hold on to mine... I can't hold on to anything. Can you just hold these? <laughs> I'm there. Uh, it's absolute agonising pain, I tell you. It really was agonising. I know it sounds pathetic compared to what people go through these days, but it was terrible, excruciating, sharp, mincing, wincing pain. Now, this must be the oh. climax of the situation. <laughs> Uh, but then we had the commercial break, and in the commercial break, the nurse who'd been watching in the first aid department, she rushed into the studio, and in the three-minute commercial break, she had my trousers down and she gave me a tetanus jab at my bottom. <laughs> you. If that had meant business, it would have been through to the bone. She's playing with you. Really? Yeah. Well, she can come around and play at it, <laughs> Ulrika, yeah, completely losing it on national television. Harry's staying with us. Ulrika's in a fit of peak over here, giggling away at these uh, various characters. <laughs> Harry Enfield's on the, the TVAM morning show, 
uh, basically to plug his show, which was on the previous night. Now, Ulrika is standing there, about ready to do the weather, and as a segue, says... I enjoyed it much... Um, <clears throat> I'm enjoying it just as much as I did last night. Ooh. <laughs> Oh, whoops, I made a sexual innuendo about last night. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. And he's... <laughs> Gary Bushell's better to be watching. She just finds it so hilarious and just cannot pull it together at all. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> a good uh, start to the day. Quite a lot of fog and frost around. Uh, quite a few shows lingering along the eastern coast of Scotland and England as well. The camera just stays on her and it does try and cut back to uh, to the presenters on the sofa and they're like, no, come on, stick with her. <laughs> we'll read her 11 Celsius in the south. Uh, stay with her, let's enjoy this, stay there. In the south. <laughs> I think what's fabulous about this is that this is a very young, very naive, corn-fed Swedish girl that is Ulrika. Not, not the idea that we have of Ulrika now that she's, uh, to, be, to be fair, been around the block a bit. Well, this afternoon, <laughs> Watching it in context to what her life has become makes it even a bit more funnier, if not a little bit darker as well. Ever heard the phrase, on your bike? Kevin Keegan obviously hadn't. He fell off his on challenge show superstars back in the 70s. Keegan's on the inside lane. Uh, they've started off together quite nicely. Superstars was fantastic. And I think, I don't know, I, I'd forgotten about this, but I always remembered Kevin Keegan. So it must have led to it being a special moment in everyone's heart. There's a bit of a wobble there from Keegan. Sort of football vernacular. Obviously, he's given it 110%. OK, now, and they're really both going for it now, but Keegan's still very wobbly there on the inside. He's looking like he could lose it at any minute. Oh, oh, and Keegan's gone. Keegan's gone there. He's fallen off. Fortunately, his permed bouffon acted like a crash helmet and took most of the blow. He's the, the knight uh, of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I've cut your arm off, mate. I've cut both your arms off and both your legs. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's all right. It's just a scratch. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. That's a bit okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. Yeah, well, a bit grazed, but uh, no, I'm done. I'm sure. I'm okay. Yeah, it's a bit sore, but uh, a couple of days, I'm fine. He was being quite, you know, brave about it, but on the other hand, the, the excuses come thick and fast. Gilbert was half a bike up on me when he come across, and. Uh, Unfortunately, if it had been a full bike up, it'd have missed me. I thought my wheels were loose. <laughs> don't know what, I don't know whether they were or not. I just felt as if they were a bit loose. I'm more used to a car than a bike, so <laughs> probably stick to one by now. And those grazes, yeah, he was all, 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 cut up all down, down there. there nasty, isn't big, nasty. Anybody yeah. who finds that funny is sick. Oh, and Keegan's gone. Keegan's gone there. He's fallen off. Next up at eight, someone makes an arse of themselves live on GMTV. But don't worry, it's not one of the presenters, just for a change. You've got to wish her luck, She I goes suppose. from strength to strength. I know, she's amazing. Ah, well, listen, Jackie, thanks ever so much. I'll probably talk to you tomorrow from Cannes. Will you... Oh! Was that a naked bottom I saw before you? Lorraine was loving it, but slightly in a kind of, I've never seen a naked man before in my life kind of way. She was like a 13-year-old schoolgirl. It was ridiculous. Oh! Was that a naked bottom I saw before you? Yeah, there's a naked man. Get that man, <laughs> get that man off the chair. My mother's watching. The sea was obviously cold that day. <laughs> I always find streaking more impressive when people don't have um, impressive genitals. That's fantastic. It's just, look at me! I have nothing to offer except my naked self! Behold! And Kelly just loves it. She's laughing. Oh, Kelly's quite kind of saucy. Oh, look! This man with his torch are out. Oh, oh, I've seen a, oh, a cock. Oh. <laughs> get that man away. Jackie, don't you look. Don't you look at that man. You see, if you become a GMTV presenter, <laughs> you see, famous for 15 minutes. Alive. There wasn't much to see anyway, to be honest. <laughs> Tell him it's um, <laughs> too much fuss over, not very much. Anyway, moving swiftly on, Jackie. <laughs> it's a good moment on what was an incredibly dull bulletin from Cannes. At number seven, there's an official who's totally totally confident that the road in the picture is not an accident black spot. Well, they do say comedy's all about timing. You couldn't have planned it any better. It's fantastic. You've got the government minister there, and if, yes, I decree this road is safe. Um, as you can see, the road seems safe. We have set up cones. There's a line of cones. The road is safe. I will not accept that it's a highly dangerous road. The road, obviously, like other roads, gives cause for concern when accidents do occur. But Mr Davidson had barely finished speaking when this happened. As soon as that work is finished, 
the Central Reserve safety fencing will go ahead. Right. Yeah. Luckily, no one was hurt in the crash. It was just another example of how hazardous the A19 can be. That made the point. It's an unsafe road. My theory is that actually the driver uh, had seen the TV crew up there and was interested. People are always fascinated by television. He was having a little look at that and up the side. The Central Reserve safety fencing will go ahead. It was a wonderful uh, choreographed moment that uh, you could never, never have organised. John and Peter are having quite a, a handful trying to bring in this little one. I think it's one of the best clips television's ever had the fortune to get. Go, this is Lulu, she's oh. from Chessington Zoo. It's just genuinely slapstick funny. And he's yeah. al she's also yeah. leading us in as well. And that's when it started going wrong. We had a big bucket of water yeah, and gave him a drink. Well, I think I'm going to give her a bucket of water and see if that'll... Have I'll you, settle Lulu. Her down. <laughs> Lulu stuck her trunk in and squirted some up, <laughs> threw it down her throat, that was fine, and immediately peed on the floor. Only male uh, elephants don't have tusks. And, um, oh, we're having a slight penny down here. <laughs> slight problem. Uh, get out of the way, I think. You're yes, supposed well. to be drinking it, Lulu. Just, uh, uh, just before it moved off, and right when we had a nice big close-up of his back end, it, uh, it crapped. Yes, <laughs> anyway, at least it did go, but it came back. <laughs> and uh, so he, he came back, and he tried to take him away again, and I think eventually they did get away. But uh, well, as I was saying, we'll see all sorts of very exciting things. <laughs> Go that way. She was a naughty, naughty baby elephant who wanted to do what she wanted to do and weighs something like ten times more than the elephant keeper. But Lulu won't be there. <laughs> oh dear. He became incredibly embarrassed. Come on, his pride was severely dented. If you got pulled through shit and piss, you wouldn't laugh, would you? But Lulu won't be there. <laughs> That's as good as any slapstick sequence you'd ever get because everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Wonderful stuff. Oh, farewell. Oh dear, I've talked right in it. <laughs> It's not all glamour, glamour, glamour when you're a TV presenter, you know. Just take a look at this. It's GMTV's Claire Nazir at five. I was really cold, my teeth were chattering, and the gale force winds, I could hardly speak. Hello, good morning, and uh, welcome to Bridlington. It didn't need her there to go. The weather is bloody awful. Did she die? I'm absolutely sodden because... These waves keep coming over and keep splashing me and also my crew. I noticed Stuart and also Pete, the salmon, looking behind me. I think, what's going on behind me? It's only sea. And just the odd... Oh, my God, what's happened to her? I was like, she's gone over the edge. She's brown bread. The odd... Oh, my God! <laughs> It didn't look as big on screen, but it was about 10 foot. It covered all of us. The odd... It was really scary and freezing cold. Oh, my goodness, Claire, are you all right? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I can you hear me. Oh, I have I'm to fine. say, heart stopping. Absolutely stopping. fine. I'm still here. Bless her cotton socks. She disappears out of camera. We all think she's dead. Then she comes back over and goes, I'm all right, I'm all right. Here's the summary. Oh, it was just so awful. As I said, Scotland will be fine and Northern Ireland wet down here, windy. Here's your summary. <laughs> See what's coming up this weekend on our website. I just thought, thank goodness that is over. Next up, a classic slip up at four. The moment former Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock found out that life can be a total beach. This is the image that defines um, Neil Kinnock's leadership of the Labour Party. This is October 1983. It's a Labour conference in Brighton. It's a classic moment in, in politicians trying to show human face on TV. Fantastic photo opportunity for all the wrong reasons. Do you want a real story? Go on, I walk on, on the water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real pratfall. It's right on his backside. And it was weird, because it's almost like, for a moment, you thought he was doing a bit of a ballroom dance twirl. And the other thing is this bizarre gesture he makes afterwards, this sort of, this, this thing he does. And then he makes this gesture like, come on, follow me, troops. 
think this guy, you know, are you going to let him in charge of the country when he can't even step back from one wave on the Brighton seafront? No, I think not. To this day, I mean, you know, decades later, he is still remembered as the guy who fell over on Pebble Beach at Brighton. Time for the classic boob. It's the moment you voted for at three. Richard and Booby on the National Television Awards. And the winners are Judy and Richard of this morning. What a phenomenal over-the-shoulder boulder holder Dame Judy of Finnegan had that night. And thank goodness she was trussed up. <laughs> How can you not feel that your dress has come completely undone? It couldn't have happened with a worse bra. It looked grey and grubby and everything else, and they were drooping. I mean, it could not have been worse if you'd have written it. Uh, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. He thinks that the crowd are cheering for him to do his Ali G impression, which was crap in the first place. Why would anyone want to see that again? And that just makes it even more embarrassing for him. <laughs> She's a true professional. She covers up and she tries to carry on, but she then grabs the mic and starts bashing the mic around. Now, a professional wouldn't do that because they'd know it was ruining the sound, and I think that shows how much it had affected her, that she really can't stop waggling the mic around. We went with it on the front page, Richard and Booby. <laughs> Uh, no, no, uh, one last thing. If you vote for us next year, she'll show you both of them. This one's a real screamer. It's the overexcitable Marco Saba on 2004's Big Brother, at two. For me, the best moment, <laughs> bar none, of Big Brother. Who do you want to win? Nadia! Nadia, please! Nadia, 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 Nadia! Marco was excited, which was pretty much 23 hours and 59 minutes of the day. Yeah, he was one of the most irritating creatures ever created. <laughs> today, well, it was Marco's day today, you know. He hasn't seen his mum for a month, so you think the first thing you do is go give her a nice hug. Not Marco. <laughs> As Marco did when I came out, I wanted to get away from Davina McCall. So he's rushing away from the ghastly Davina McCall. He's gone in and absolutely two-footed his mum, smashed her. It was like the best sliding tackle you've ever seen. He completely took her out. <laughs> what a brilliant mother that is. He's now dragged you down onto the floor on live television, and all she could do was laugh, and I just thought that was amazing. Oh, dear, they're OK, they're OK. That's just Marco all over, do you know what I'm saying? This was 1993, and supermodels were sort of up there with, you know, God. What we liked about the young Niobe, the supermodel, was the fact that she was a beautiful, fresh face, British and black, very successful all around the world. She was a goddess. She could not put a foot wrong. Girls like like myself, just like, oh my God, these girls can do no wrong. Something had to give, and it did in dramatic, spectacular fashion in front of lots of people. The next thing you know, Naomi Campbell's on the news, falling over uh, huge heels and landing on her arse. You're like, yes, yes, they're not perfect. You know, at this stage in her career, when she was pay being paid £10,000 to get out of bed and just walk up and down, and she couldn't even do it properly, <laughs> there's something quite amusing about that, I think. 
Vivian Westwood is really famous for a very kind of cartoony look. She had these sort of ludicrous oversized platforms. They can be anything from like sort of five inches right up to like, you know, 15 inches or something, which I think is what Naomi Campbell was wearing. And it's basically like walking on stilts. The way they walked with their hips thrust forward, ultra sex, ultra sex. It's not the sort of shoe you can do that walk in. Vivian Westwood's shoes, everybody in the fashion world, they're respected, they're loved. But to actually walk on or go out dancing or, you know, actually step out the front door in, that's another thing, completely ridiculous. Whoa, those heels were so high. Well, that's all we've got time for tonight. And I hope you enjoy the cock-ups as much as I'm so relieved I didn't make too many whilst presenting it. Goodbye. Ah. Oh.